Hi everybody, welcome back to Super Awesome Calculus. We're in chapter 5, entitled The Fundamental Theorem, um, and I'm Augie Kennedy. Providing I said that already, I apologize, I'm a bit hungover. I guess I can admit that. What are they going to do, fire me? So, anyway, last time we went over the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus, both parts 1 and part 2. Today we're going to talk about indefinite integrals, but before we do that, there are two things I'd like to go over. The first I'd like is a, is a little bit of advice that I'd like to share with the male viewers out there. Female viewers, odds are you already are very well aware of the material that I'm about to present, so you don't necessarily need to follow. Male viewers, take heed. This is the fundamental theorem. Fundamental theorem of bar beauties. These are the really attractive women you'll meet at bars one day. First thing, first thing, the fundamental theorem of bar beauty says, you must not, must not appear interested, appear interested in film or most importantly, math. Remember the Leibniz corollary that math has never gotten anyone laid by a really, really attractive woman. That's true. Now, second thing to know about the fundamental theorem, you must, if you're in college, say that you are a major in Ed Hardy design with a minor or concentration, depending on your school, in GTL. I'm not really sure what GTL stands for, but this is very important. Uh, you can probably find out the answers to uh, what GTL really is online. Um, but it's very important that you minor or concentrate in that. Or third, even better, even better, Say you dropped out and joined the drug trade. If you are a member of the drug trade, you're in really good shape. So, remember, the fundamental theorem of bar beauties, you know the really svelte, attractive looking ones at the bar, do not appear interested in film or math. Major in Ed Hardy design and minor in GTL. And third, if you choose not to do this, you can say you dropped out and joined the drug trade. If you do these three things, the success rate, the marginal rate of success will go from like here to like there. So I'm like, here. <laughs> so you want to be there. Anyway, that's the fundamental theorem of bar beauties. Women, you can now rejoin the lecture. Now, last time I gave you a problem to work out that tested your knowledge of the fundamental theorem of calculus, but also tested the idea of the antiderivative. Now you remember, part two of the fundamental theorem of calculus said that for any integral, between a and b of f of x dx, the answer to that definite integral is any antiderivative of f of x evaluated at b minus any antiderivative of f valued at a. So, let's see how this works. We have, uh, last time I gave you this question. I asked you to evaluate this integral Remember, this is the big S sign for integral. I don't know if that's big enough. Okay. Alright. Integral from a half to square root of 3 over 2. And the function that I gave you was 6 over the square root of 1 minus t squared dt. Now, looking at this, I gave you a hint and said that there's a very key observation to be made here, that if you don't make it, this integral might be prohibitively difficult to set up for you. 
But if you did make the observation, whoopsie, you'd, you'd be right on point. So, moving on, we know that 6 is a constant. 6 is a constant, it's a number, it doesn't really have anything to do with the function, so we're going to take it outside of the integral. So this is really the same as saying 6 times the integral between 1 half and square root of 3 over 2 of 1 over the square root of 1 minus t squared. I'll just write the dt up here. Now this, this function, might look familiar to you. And if you remember the antiderivatives, you'd know that this function, 1 over the square root of 1 minus t squared, is none other than the derivative f prime x of arc sine or sine inverse. So that, this is the derivative of arc sine. So naturally, an antiderivative, and the one we'll want to use, is arc sine. So really, this function, the integral, is 6 times sine inverse of t evaluated between square root of 3 over 2 and 1 half. If you got that far and you don't know the trig values, congratulate yourself. That's very good. If you do know the trig values, you'd know that the answer to this would be 6 times inver arc sine of square root of 3 over 2 is pi over 3. Arc sine of a half is pi over 6. So you get 6 times pi over 6, which is just pi. So the answer to that integral is pi. Pretty cool, huh? So that takes care of the big problem. Now today's lecture is going to be very easy. We're going to be talking about the idea of the indefinite integral. The definite integral requires having bounds a and b. We know what a is, we know what b is, we have an f of x dx, we know that we can evaluate this by taking the antiderivative of the top, antiderivative evaluated at the bottom, and subtract. We know that. But what happens if I say, in general, what's the antiderivative of f of x? No bounds, no upper and lower bounds, just in general. This is called an indefinite integral. And an indefinite integral, you'll see, is much easier to solve than a definite integral. And we'll generally, from here on out, generally, in, unless we're dealing with practical applications, be working with indefinite integrals. So, an indefinite integral, the answer is very simply the antiderivative of x plus c, some arbitrary constant. So today, I think the best thing to do is to just remind you of what some of these indefinite integrals are. This takes us back to the whole antiderivative idea. For instance, if you have this integral, let's look at this, c f of x dx, like for instance 3x squared. Well, that's simply c times the integral f of x dx. In other words, if you have to take the integral of 3x squared, it's just 3 times the integral of x squared. If you have a sum, <clears throat> f of x plus g of x dx, that's very simply the, sum, the integral of f of x dx plus the integral of g of x dx. Always remember that dx. And always remember what we're about to use, the plus c, right here. If you have k d of x, why am I using k and not c? Because I'm awesome like that. k can just be any number. The integral of 3 would be kx plus c. You might remember this from, uh, from antiderivatives. The integral of 3 isn't 3. It's 3x plus c. Okay? So if you're taking the integral of a constant, it's that constant times x plus some c. 
All right. Now, for some more heavy duty ones. In general, x to the n dx is x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 plus c. So like x cubed dx is just going to be x to the fourth over 4 plus c. Um, another one, we've got e to the x dx, the integral of the exponential function. This is as easy as it was with differentiation. It's e to the x plus c. Right here, we've got sine x dx. Well, you might know this one. What, what will give you sine? Well, it's negative cosine x plus c. So those are three more functions. They follow off of your basic derivative rules. Let's see, what else have we got here? We've got this one, which, which I hope you've started to remember by now. Secant squared x dx is tangent of x plus c. Secant, remember, the derivative of tangent is secant squared. Right here, concordantly, we have secant x tan x dx. And as you might know, that's secant x plus c, because the derivative of secant is secant x tan x. And we've got this one. This one's one of my favorite, 1 over 1 plus x squared dx is, go for it, yeah, arctangent x plus c. Pretty cool. Now, moving on more. See, these are just, this is just a review of some of our derivatives. It's the same general mechanic. We have this one, 1 over x dx. Well, we know that the, the derivative of the natural logarithm is 1 over x, so ln x plus c. Oh, ln absolute value of x. That's important. It's kind of trivial, but because mostly you'll be dealing with positive numbers, but it is true that you, it, you do need to take the absolute value because it can't be a negative. We, we can't evaluate the ln of negative 2. It doesn't exist. Remember, natural logarithm looks like this, kind of. So it, it's only defined at x greater than 0. So ln of absolute value of x plus c. We've got this one, a general exponential. a to the x is a to the x over ln a plus c. I think we went over that when we talked about exponential functions, general exponentials. And finally, a couple more. We've got cosine x dx. Well, we know that one is going to be sine x plus c. We've got cosecant squared dx, <clears throat> fairly important. This is going to be negative cotangent x plus c. Just like secant squared x dx is tangent x, cosecant squared dx is negative cotangent. So the same basically follows for cosecant x times cotangent x dx. You might correctly guess that this is, in fact, negative cosecant x plus c. And finally, leading to last night's big problem, in general, 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared dx is arc sine x plus c. That's your table of indefinite integrals. Use them wisely and enjoy them. Now this brings us to another idea, one final idea that I need to present in this section, 
And that's the idea of the net change theorem. Now the net change theorem, the way I look at it, is basically like the people trying to keep saying the fundamental theorem of calculus as if it were something new. The net change theorem says that the integral of a rate of change is the net change of a to b big F prime x dx equals fb minus fa. This is pretty obvious because f prime x is just f of x. Substitute that back in. It's just another way of writing the fundamental theorem. But what it says is that if we need to figure out the integral over some rate of change, well, we just take the net change, we find the antiderivative, and there we go. Uh, put this in practice. Here's an example from the book that I think is pretty useful in understanding the concept of the net change theorem. All right, the example is such. We're gonna look at a particle that's moving along the line such that its velocity at time t is velocity v of t equals t squared minus t minus six meters per second, okay? The first thing we wanna do is we wanna find the displacement of this particle between one second and four seconds. Well, we know that S4, position at four, minus S1, via the net change theorem, is one to four of V of T DT. All right? So basically it's the integral one to four T squared minus T minus six. How do we know that it's VT? Because remember, position, the derivative of position is velocity. So if we have big F four minus big F one, equals f prime, integral a to b, f prime dx. Oh no, it's raining. Well, I hope it doesn't interfere with the sound quality too much. Anyway, we can integrate this function very easily. t cubed over three minus t squared over two minus six t evaluated between four and one. You do the math there plug in, evaluate these at four, subtracted by them, evaluated at one, and we get negative nine halves. So the particle's moving to the left, negative 4.5 meters. Ah, it's really coming down. All right, so that's the idea of the net change theorem. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to assign you a question the big problem for today is an economics question. I think it might be useful. The question is, the marginal cost of manufacturing X yards of a certain fabric is C prime X equals three minus 0.01 X plus 0.000006 X squared in dollars per yard. Find the increase in cost if the production level is raised from 2,000 yards to 4,000 yards. So what do you have here? You've got an, an upper bound, 4,000, a lower bound, 2,000, and the marginal cost function, which is the derivative of the cost. So we have something that's right out of the net change theorem. Go ahead and plug it in and see what you get. I'll see you next time when we talk about something a little bit more difficult, the substitution rule. All right, thanks for joining and take care everyone.